Hey guys, this is Keenan Fry, and you're watching the Acid Drip. So I am back now, and I'm gonna kind of like lower this crank a little bit. Right about there, that's a good height. So what we're gonna be doing now is working on the rest of the, um, let me finish, excuse me, mic bump. Sorry about that. So what we're gonna be doing now is working on the rest of this. So. Um, initially, the first layer that you put on here is going to be really rough and kind of tacky. Um, I actually put down two layers today while uh, the sun was up because it was bloody hot out. And uh, sorry, that's the dog. So it was bloody hot out and the first layer dried very quickly this morning. I put that one on pretty early. The second layer dried um by the early afternoon so i'm actually going to be able to do three layers a day which is kind of nice um coincidentally while i was leaving the guitar out to dry this part of the guitar the little plastic piece warped in the heat so i'm gonna um take care to make sure that it's under the awning which is why it was really important to um spray down those wasps because now that they're dead and they've been cleared out i can leave the guitar under the awning and it will uh, basically dry due to the temperature but it won't be directly exposed to the sunlight so that's one of the things you want to avoid um, I would have actually put it under the awning earlier today had the nest not been there so um, going forward that's a really important thing to remember if you leave your guitar in direct sunlight um, it can potentially warp the parts so one of the things that I now have to do um, it's not likely but it's possible is that any um, solder could have been damaged, any soldering. It's unlikely because you have to get solder really hot to melt it. But what is more likely, and it depends on the instrument, is the pickups might have been damaged. And the reason for that is uh, wax coatings are very commonly applied to the outer coil of a, a humbucker or single coil pickup. Um, it's pretty much standard procedure and the wax basically binds the coil together and it prevents the windings from separating over time which is a possibility um, from being bumped around or from the guitar being you know moved and such or like if you're traveling with your guitar because you're a professional musician and you you know get on a plane it's possible that because you know you're moving around that the um, the uh, pickups get shaken up and the wires get loose in there. So, um, or in this case, the coils get loose. So they put the wax on there to hold it in place and it's possible that by leaving it out in the sun for as long as I did, it's possible that wax got damaged. So um, again, if you're gonna do a project like this, try to put your guitar outside to dry because it's obviously a really strong smell. The linseed oil is very strong or in this case, I'm using the true oil. This stuff smells really, really, really strong. I mean like toxic strong if you have it in a contained room. Um, so you have to do it outside. You have to have to do it outside. You have to do it on a level surface so it can penetrate the wood and, and sort of like self level. Um, but you do have to, you have to unconditionally do it outside. Um, there's no real way around it. So you gotta put your guitar in the shade. So um, with that, you know, four minutes of rambling out of the way, I'm gonna now jump into uh, polishing this. So for starters, we're gonna go back to the um, highest grit of the uh, steel wool, or excuse me, the lowest grit of the steel wool, which was um, these guys right here. So I have two of these red ones, which are a little bit rougher, and I don't wanna really start on that. So what I'm trying to do is now buff out this finish. So I'm gonna kind of move things around and get you guys a little bit more oriented towards this. Look at that. So what we're gonna work on right here is gonna be just smoothing it out. And again, you just go with the grain and you just take a thin layer off. Now remember, these are the first few layers, so they're always gonna be rough. You wanna be kind of gentle with it. Also, while you're doing this layer, any scratches that occurred around your uh, modifications, this is a really good time to, to further buff those out. So like, you know, I'm going around the edge and I'm moving a nice 
smooth circles. Now, technically I am moving a little bit against the grain right now, but that's because I'm really trying to clean this up and you have to be a little bit aggressive with it. So yeah, I'm just gonna kind of hold it down and do this. Now, um, on a side note, I've got my guitar on this kind of weird stand thing and um, it's a guitar prop stand. And I've seen these stands in pretty much every single professional shop. Anybody who's worth their salt has one of these when it comes to fixing up a guitar. It's basically just a foam cushion and then a, a split for the neck over here. You just put some foam on it and you know, glue the foam down. Um, I recommend that you get some MDF and you just make one yourself. If you try and buy one of these, they sell them for a hundred bucks. It's the most ridiculous bullshit ever, you know? Um, guitar supplies are really, really overpriced because there are a lot of dilettante sort of amateur builders, craftsmen who want to, you know, pretend that they're a luthier. It's the whole, you know, lawyer stereotype where like lawyer comes into a guitar center, wants to buy a guitar, buys the custom Stevie Ray Vaughan ripoff guitar, buys the same amp, spends, you know, eight grand on all of this supplies and stuff. The salesperson gets a really awesome commission. You go to the lawyer's house and it's called wall art. The guitar is hanging from a wall and the amp is set up next to it. All the supplies and things you could imagine needing to have. And lo and behold, it's, it's a piece of wall art guitar never gets played, amp never gets plugged in, let alone turned on. Um, so yeah, it's one of those one of those situations. So because of that, I think that uh, a lot of guitar equipment, equipment <laughs> is uh, ridiculously overpriced. And, and the culprits, in my opinion, are Stuart Mac. Stu Mac is like ridiculous. I can understand maybe for some certain specialty parts, like if you want to buy a file for your um, frets, yeah, you're going to pay a premium for that because, you know, getting a file, so the, the side of the file, um, can I have a file that I can use as an example? No, I don't. Okay, I'm just going to use the foam as an example. So like, imagine that this is the flat side of the file. And again, this is the side. Well, the expensive files that you buy for your um, fret work to recrown a fret, you know, whatever it is you got to do, they have a groove in them in the side part that's the exact size of your steel fret wire. So you have to look up the make and model of your guitar and the fret wire that they used. And you should know that generally speaking offhand, um, mine is 2150 from, uh, warm off for the Mustang, which is in my room. Um, it's that fret wire. So uh, it's the stainless steel jumbo fret wire by warm off. Um, and I do stainless steel instead of nickel because if you play guitar for about 20, 30 years, you'll start to absorb nickel into your fingers and you'll develop a nickel allergy. And that's not a joke, that's a real thing. If you get a cheap guitar, um, it's highly likely that there's nickel in the fret wire and you will get um, an, an allergy to nickel and it'll build up in your fingers and it can actually cause you to have nerve damage. Um, a lot of weird, weird things like that. And you wouldn't see it normally happen, but like because you're a guitar player and you, you know, plan on playing until you die, that's generally what a guitar player is, a committed musician. Um, it takes 20, 30 years for the nickel to build up, but once it does, you know, that's kind of it. So it's a way to preemptively end your career if you're not careful. So. Again, use steel fret wire, um, which is exactly what I use for all of my instruments. And whenever I buy an instrument, it has to have steel fret wire, stainless steel. Um, it's a little bit more expensive, but it's just, it's just you know, higher quality, better for your health. It's, it's worth the money. So anyway, um, you get the stainless steel fret wire and you get a uh, fret file that's designed specifically for your gauge of fret wire. And, you know, I can understand them charging an arm and a leg for a file like that because pretty much no one else is going to use it. Your audience or your market for that, um, for that particular tool is very limited and niche. So I can understand charging an arm and a leg for a, a tool like that to keep something like that in stock. 
and keep it like within reason available to a um, diverse customer base. But um, other things like generic files, generic saws, StuMac is obscenely overpriced. So I, I recommend that if you can, you know, do something yourself, always do that. If you can figure it out yourself, if you can do it yourself, if you do it unconventionally, it doesn't really matter. It's just that you did it yourself, that you figured it out and you didn't rely on somebody else to tell you how to do it. You went your own way and figured it out. So there's some rough stuff right here on the edge of the neck, which means that this neck is definitely gonna need some polishing. That rough stuff is from the grain. The grain is not too happy that I, you know, filed the crap out of it and really wore it down, but that's kind of the case with this kind of stuff. Now, while it may seem like I'm wearing the finish off, um, this wood is so porous that I guarantee you most of the finish actually entered the wood and that there's actually not a lot of finish on top. And what is actually on top are sort of like these uneven little crystals that formed in the oil as it dried. And so what I'm doing now is I'm, I'm smoothing that out. So when I put the next layer, instead of crystals stacking on top of crystals and creating these weird uneven bumps and ridges, I'm uh, going to have a really smooth neck. And part of it is every time I do a stroke with it, I really try again to go all the way up, like we talked about last night. And then after I do a couple of these strokes, you know, I, I lean back and I feel it. And I feel, you know, the, the quality of it. And I try and find any rough spots that need to get buffed out. And so far it feels really good. And I like it. There's a little bit roughness right there, but that will be due to the wood grain itself than the actual finish. So the best thing I can do in that case is to just keep working it and working it, you know? So yeah, that's what it's like to basically modify a guitar. The longer you take, the more patience you have, the better the project comes out. So this summer, I'm gonna do two of these. I'm gonna do the Mustang, or not the Mustang, the Explorer and the Flying V. A few years back, I did my Mustang. Like I said, I've done this many times. I've done it to multiple blank necks, an Ibanez Geo, and a um, Ovation GP, which I destroyed both of those, the Geo and the GP. Um, beautiful guitar, the GP. I'll pull it out one of these days and show it to you and show you what ended up happening to it so you understand why you have to be very responsible when you do a modification like this. Um, but yeah, GP, um, I did a project like this on a friend's. Uh, he has a jazz master. That's right. Kevin has a jazz master. So I helped him do it to his jazz master, did it obviously to the Mustang, said that before. Me and Kevin built a guitar together. I built my Mustang, he built his jazz master. That's kind of, that was kind of our big bro moment, bromance moment. He, uh, his dad owns a metal shop and we worked on a guitar together. We each built our own guitar. His guitar, his guitar, it's the craziest thing ever. His guitar has a goat milk finish. That's right, goat milk. So goat milk is apparently very common to be made into whitewash for like barns and stuff. So what we did was we put a goat milk paint down. We put two layers of it down, like this crazy sort of baby blue color and then this vintage like white color. And then we buffed the crap out of that guitar and we like relicked it basically. So you know when you go to a guitar center and you see the $4,000 Strat that looks like it got thrown under a bus? That's a relic Strat. They're bullshit. It's like just a marketing scam because you know people want to buy a guitar that looks like it's worn in when it hasn't been worn in at all. It's another one of those like, you know, selling an aesthetic and a vibe and you know, really selling the authentic truth. And of course the people who buy those kinds of guitars, 
they'll never do a mod on a guitar themselves, but they'll buy a beat up guitar. It's the dumbest thing ever. Anyway, so they, they got these relics guitars that they sell for like three to four times the price of a regular brand new looking one. Like I've seen basically an American Strat for like 1200. Um, usually during the holidays, they put out a special edition American made Strat for around the 12, hundred maybe one thousand dollar range try and sell a few holiday units and um usually around that time they also put the relic guitars out <laughs> it's pretty funny because those relics are going for like three four grand and the brand new looking strat that's like you know got no dings or dents is like a thousand maybe twelve hundred dollars tops and it's the same freaking guitar uh Makes me laugh to know how gullible people are. So yeah, if you want to really have a guitar with character, you know, put the character in the guitar by working on it yourself. You know, put put effort into it. So this feels really good, and that's a really good grit. Um, really good place to stop with this grit, and we're going to go to a higher grit. We're going to polish it a little bit more, and then we're going to lay on the next layer. And then I'm going to go inside and practice some Stevie Ray Vaughan. So let's get that next grit. Let's see here. I think it's going to be. Okay, this is other new sheets of sandpaper. That's definitely not what I'm going to polish it with. Um, should be one of these guys. It's 60. Here we go, Sandwet. It's the 1200. Yep, and then there's a 2000 Sandwet. Where is the 2000? That's another 60. That's a 220. That's not bad. I got a 220. I don't even know that. There's 180. Might just be using the 1000, 150. Yep, I just got the 1000 Sandwet. That's okay. This stuff's great. Yeah, both 1200. So wet sandpaper is really unique because um, it's for finish work. And it's really interesting because you cannot get a quality finish without wet sanding. So if you want your guitar to look as best as it can um, after doing a modification to make it not look like ghetto and beat up, <laughs> Because while it's nice to, you know, do a mod like this and make your guitar have, like, character, it's another thing to make your guitar look like a beat-up, ghetto, busted machine. You know, you don't, you don't want a ghetto banger. You want a real sexy piece of worn-in guitar, not, not a beat-up piece of shit, you know. Ghetto, <laughs> ghetto banger. I don't even know what I'm talking about anymore. But uh, you got to wet sand it to get it smooth. And the other reason why you got to wet sand it is that in this case, there's two finishes. There's the original sort of like a satin finish. And then there's the new one that I'm putting on. And I really want to smoothen out the transition. This is why we wet sand because we want to blend the transition in the neck. So like there's this spot where you can clearly see this the line I mean you can very clearly see it you know um, yeah so you can see the edge of the line going down the middle of the neck so what I'm trying to do is reduce that 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 difference by wet sanding it you can very clearly see the line right here on the neck heel this is the unfinished area this is the finished so the wet sanding really helps blend the new finish with the old one. It makes it feel smoother. When you play, you're not gonna notice. It's not gonna feel like you're going from one finish to another. One of the things that people don't understand is um, a huge part of the feel that you get from a guitar is strictly from the finish. Um, a lot of people actually prefer an unfinished neck. Um, sometimes if you have a finish that's really tacky, um, it actually makes it hard for you to move your hand across the neck because your hand starts to sweat and then because of the sweat your hand kind of sticks at a certain point to the neck 
and that's just a really bad finish. And you know, cheaper guitars tend to be really tacky like that. Um, nicer guitars tend to have a more of a luster to their finish and your hand won't stick to it. Um, granted, it's a minor speed bump. If you're a good guitarist, you'll pretty much be able to overcome any kind of like obstacle or barrier that is, you know, between you and achieving whatever kind of musical expression you're trying to reach for in the moment. And I'm going to assume that everybody who's watching this is a good guitar player. Everybody watching this. You know, you guys are all good players. You guys all have good habits. You guys practice every day. You guys do your scales, your modes, your arpeggios. I'm sure of it. You're all good players. Because <laughs> that's the only thing we want on this channel. We only want good musicians on this channel. Good, dedicated musicians and artists. So I'm going to assume you're all doing your homework, studying your circle of fifths, you know, your modes, and so on and so forth, your arpeggios, you know, seventh chord arpeggios, all that, you know, fun stuff, all that jazz. <laughs> so yeah, um, like I said, this will make a guitar play better in terms of its comfort and like just overall utility but it won't make you a better player, you know. I'm doing this because I already know I'm a good player. I already know that I'm committed to my instrument. You know, it's not like I'm gonna do this and then next week say, well, I'm gonna give up on playing the guitar. It's like, I'm gonna be doing this until I die. That's the other reason why I'm doing this is because I'm gonna have this guitar until I die. So yeah, there's also that. <laughs> I don't really care about doing the mod. The mod is a good thing improving the value of this instrument significantly so I think I've done a pretty good job of getting that smoothened out you don't want to wet sand something too much early on because um, that's actually a way to clog up the grain and get a bunch of crap in there that you don't want in there so what we're now going to do actually is we're going to very lightly bust this with a bit of TSP. I'm going to go in my room, grab the TSP and come back. And we're going to bust this with some TSP very, very quickly, lightly. And then that's going to help me get all of this crap out of the grain. And then what's going to happen is we're going to hit it with the finish again. So I'll see you in just a minute. Well, Sorry about that, just a second ago the video went out. I'm gonna go get the TSP and come right back though. Thank you for your patience, sorry about that. All right, and we're back. Now I've got the trisodium phosphate and we're gonna just scrub this guy down and, and get it going. So um, what I'm gonna do is just pour a little bit more of it into the Tupperware. We're done uh, with the wet sanding. So I'm gonna use the same water. Um, let's just get this going. Try sodium phosphate. Let me read you a thing or two about this. So what this is saying right here is that uh, because it's a trisodium phosphate cleaner, it's um, it's basically designed for removing greasy, sooty dirt and prepares painted surfaces for repainting. So um, it's it's very good for protecting or for working with um, surfaces that are already protected. This stuff though is really, really strong and will burn the living shit out of your eyes and out of your skin. So technically I should be wearing gloves, but um, you know, I'm kind of just winging this. I'm not gonna lie, I should be wearing gloves. Um, but what I am gonna do, and this is the truth, is I'm just gonna very carefully dab this and just kind of work with it. Um, I generally speaking just work like this all the time um, I'm pretty careful to not intake the chemicals that I'm working with, but you know, that's a whole nother realm of uh, <laughs> stupidity. Um, so you gotta be careful not to, not to eat any of this stuff. I technically have a cup right here that's filled with juice and 
as you can see while I'm working on this, I'm not going to drink any of my juice. Um, so, you know, when you're when you're working with chemicals, you might be tempted to like take a sip of water or something like that. Don't. Instead, what you've got to do is work with the chemical, get completely finished with it, go wash your hands, very thoroughly dry and clean them, and then, you know, go back and wash your hands again. So as soon as this is done and I'm done painting the oil on here, I will go clean my hands. So that is going to clean that. And now I'm going to buff it down with just a regular old paper towel. Try and get all the crap out of it. And uh, let's see how it turns out. So the trisodium phosphate is not going to interact with the oil, it is just going to interact with any of the sawdust or dust finish. So the, the dust from the finish that got ground off from me working on this thing with the wet sandpaper. So yeah, that definitely got a lot of that crap out. So now what I need to do is just let it dry out for a minute. So I'm gonna go do a thing or two and come back in just a minute. Yeah, there's still some shit packed in the drain. It's gonna take a second to get some of this out. So I, I am touching it and I can feel it like immediately when I when I touch it with my skin, I can feel it immediately kind of itch my fingertips. And I have calluses on my fingertips, mind you. It's not like my fingertips are bare and exposed. It's like I have calluses from playing and I still feel an itch. So this stuff is really goddamn strong. Do not eat or drink anything while working with trisodium phosphate. In fact, you know, just toss that out right now. It's really easy to have a slip of the mind, have a little moment of absent mindedness and accidentally take a sip of something and get real goddamn sick. You know. If it was really hot out and I was doing this during the day, I'd probably like go inside and get a drink of water, but that's why I'm doing this at night. <laughs> Cause it's bloody hot out and I'd rather do this at night and not stress about it. So yeah. So my day's been all right. I got to hang out with my good buddy Amir. Got to see Amir Ashwar, good friend of mine. Just got back from going to Spain, went to Madrid, Mallorca, and Barcelona. Oh man, or no, he didn't go to Madrid this time. They're gonna go to Madrid next time. I'm gonna go with him summer 2020, and we're gonna go back to Mallorca, and we might do a trip to Madrid, and then go further south and go to the very southern coast of Spain and then maybe make a trip to Morocco and see Casa Blanca. Now that would be a trip. You know, actually, I think this TSP is doing its job now. Mm. Looks like it's kind of working. That's pretty good. It's hard to tell. Sometimes I can tell, sometimes I can't. Right now I'm not sure. It's not itching my hand, which means I got it all off for the most part. It's, it's a little bit dry on my hands. I'll have to Put some moisturizer on my hands afterwards. Most of it got off. Yeah, looks like I did a pretty good job of it. All right, I think I'm gonna hit it with the oil. All right, let's do it. Put that over there. So before we hit it with the oil, we're gonna um, clean up the workspace because. Uh, the last thing you want to do is get any dust on this while you're putting oil down. So I'm going to do something that's kind of like illegal and I'm going to put my guitar barefaced on the uh, chair.
Um, generally speaking, I don't recommend doing this, but I accidentally left my guitar stand in my room like a idiot. Um, I don't ever recommend doing this because you can bump your guitar and knock it over. But I gotta just move a few things out of the way. And then I'm gonna put the guitar back on this. Alright. Boom. And the reason why I recommend never doing that, <laughs> well, uh, that's how I broke my Ovation GP the first time I broke it. Um, I uh, knocked it over. And uh, that was a doozy. Alright, let's get this going like so. Alright. And I remember I was telling you guys about how Gibsons have the, uh, the fatal genetic flaw of uh, having that that uh, headstock, that headstock angle that's just really poorly, poorly designed. Um, it's It really is a fatal flaw in the design of the guitar. It's, Jesus Christ, this fucking cable, come on. Jesus bloody Christ. Hey, get the hell out of here. Ah. So, that flaw makes them incredibly vulnerable to snapping. And uh, this guitar has it right here. See, see how that back bows? I'll actually show you what I'm talking about. Um, how can I set it up so you can see it? Okay, here you go. You can see how this is going back. It's back bowing, right? And you can see it, especially on this side. You can see how it arches back, right? That's the back bow. See, the headstock goes like this, and then it arches back. That's the Gibson design. It's a really poor design, in my opinion. This should be a scarf joint if it was up to me, uh, if they're going to do a headstock like this. Otherwise, it shouldn't be like that. Um, Fender does it flat with those string trees like I showed you last time. Oh, one other thing. I like to hang charms kind of like voodoo charms. This one is an arrowhead made by a friend of mine, Ed, Ed Bo Slim from Custom Metal. And then right here, we've got a little trinket that I picked up while I was visiting uh, Kevin and Crystal out in South Carolina. I love Carolina. I'd go out there again on a heartbeat. So again, I told you I made this guitar stand and it's kind of jank. Got to hit it with a hammer to tap the uh, top part back into place, but it'll work for now. So I got my same brush again. It's like a silicone brush. I'm gonna hit it once with some paint thinner. It's gonna kind of loosen the bristles up a little bit. Work that in there. Yeah, again, I should probably be wearing gloves so I don't absorb this through my skin and get cancer or whatever the hell. Probably will get cancer from all the chemicals I've worked with in my day. But whatever, you know, you're going to die one day, so fuck it. <laughs> May as well play guitar and have a good time while you're alive. That way you can at least enjoy the fact that you lived and you don't have to worry about dying. Granted, don't be an idiot and just you know, needlessly expose yourself to harm, but in the end, you know, life is life. You're going to live, you're going to die. Life is life, death is death. You know, play guitar, play mono black EDH, drink plenty of lemon Arizona iced tea. I guarantee you I am not sponsored by Arizona, although if Arizona offered me a sponsorship, I probably would take it just because I love iced tea so much. But yeah, drink your lemon Arizona, play your guitar, and play lots and lots of EDH with your friends. EDH, yep. Yep, yep, yep. Gonna play me some strip mine and EDH. <laughs> I'm that guy. I'm the guy.
Let's get it going. So my favorite Magic the Gathering color combinations are Sultai, Teemer, and uh, yeah, those are my two favorites. I like Jund sometimes, and I occasionally like Naya, but I'm not really a white player. Again, anti-white. The only time I play Naya is if like it's like a Wild Nacoddle kind of deck, and then like you're basically playing white for Wild Nacoddle and like Path to Exile, and that's basically it. That and maybe Thalia. Yeah, you definitely play Thalia when you play Zoo. Um, <laughs> Thalia is the reason to play Zoo. That and Goyf. Um, but I, I kind of think that, uh, to be honest with you, like as much as Thalia contributes, and so does Path, I think that um, Fatal Push is just as effective as Path. And uh, I think that instead of Thalia, um, which is kind of like a reactive card, I like uh, Dark Confidant. So that's the thing like if I were to ever play zoo it would just be you know dark confidant instead of Thalia and instead of path just fatal push and I think that's a much more effective strategy because dark confidant's way more proactive when you're playing magic the gathering because uh, you want to be drawing threats when you're playing zoo like yes stalling other people out and kind of interrupting their ability to play things is very useful when playing zoo but um, there are better things to do. I think Zoo is a fun archetype, but I think it's strictly worse than Mono Red Prison, which is able to do what a lot of the things Zoo tries to do, but it does it with Blood Moon, the support of Blood Moon and Chalice. So, because Mono Red Prison has basically got a more consistent mana base, and takes less damage from its mana because of that. It's a better predatory deck, depending on your metagame, you know, for your area. But yeah, I think, um, <coughs> oh, fuck. <coughs> that's, why, that's why I'm joking about getting cancer, but like, seriously, <laughs> I'm gonna get cancer. <laughs> um, but yeah, Mona Red Prison is, is, is pretty good. You know, it's very, very much predatory against mana greedy decks. Mana intensive, color greedy decks, yeah. I don't know how to describe it. Decks that use three, sometimes even four colors. Like humans is super greedy. And punishing humans is always fun because punishing humans is like just the delight of any modern player that and you know dredge of course punishing dredge stupid creeping chill <laughs> dredge did not get any new toys it's like dredge got a new toy that it didn't deserve <laughs> let your dreams be memes so kaylee gannon i don't know actually if he came up with that or not before this expires. I'm just gonna put a little bit on here. So I am putting a little bit on the um, side of the fretboard and the reason is because um, by brushing some onto the fretboard, I am protecting the seam between the fretboard and the uh, neck itself, which I have exposed by sanding this down. So by putting some you know, oil on that, it's gonna help protect that seam and prevent um, any oils or grease from my fingers getting in between the fretboard and the neck, which could cause rot on the guitar. Um, let me just put that right there. Let me just touch this. It's funny because it's not very thick, and 
it's just sinking right in right away like it's very quickly sinking in like this wood is very very thirsty because it's so porous it's surprising how thirsty this mahogany is i've only finished maple i finished mahogany once on my um gp but like it was a very light finish i was basically doing it as like a as like a symbolic gesture because I was trying to protect the guitar from wood rot, but I wasn't lacquering it up or, or oiling it up so that I could play it again. It was really just, you know, so it wouldn't rot and I could like keep it in like somewhat reasonably preserved condition. So I could like, you know, every once in a while, like pick it up and plug it in and play it at a studio gig, never play it live. Um, so the GP is preserved. I could like maybe record an album on it if I kept it in my room and like never let it leave my room because it's it's very fragile. But um, I didn't really do a whole lot to finish it. I just put a few layers down to protect it. This one I'm really gonna try and lay down like a thick enough layer where it looks almost like clear coat. And that's because I really want this to, to just be very resilient. So yeah, um, that's kind of where I'm at with this for right now I might try and put on a little bit more because it's just soaking it up so quickly and it's pretty tacky which means like it usually takes longer to get tacky once it's tacky you can maybe put a little bit more on so I'm going to put some more on because it's just absorbing it and, and I know it's not drying but I know it's absorbing so whatever I put on is is going to still stick um, so I'm going to reset the camera real quick hey and we're back so I'm gonna put that final layer on. Let me just move this out of the way. When this final layer is done, I am going to clean the brush, then I will clean my hands, and then when the brush is clean and my hands are clean, I will pack everything up. So let's just put it right on top. So the reason why I'm not resting it in the, in the next slot, even though that's there, is because this foam will stick, will, definitely stick to the um, to the finish that I'm painting on to the oil finish that we're doing and I don't want that to happen obviously um, one it'll ruin the stand and two it'll ruin the guitar um, so yeah I'm just kind of like resting it on top but it's pretty much essential to have one of these you know spend 10 bucks buy a good piece of MDF get some insulation foam or something like that it depends on wherever it is you get it, but you can get really good cheap foam and just put down some foam to pad it yourself and that's it. You know, you're just, you're <laughs> building a really simple guitar stand and a stand like this is a hundred dollars on Stu Mac. I already had my whole rant about Stu Mac. I won't subject you to that rant again, but yeah, Stu Mac is ridiculously overpriced. You know, you only go there for specialty stuff. A workbench thing like this is commonplace. You wouldn't need to buy it from them or anyone else. Just make one yourself. That's kind of my attitude towards everything is make it yourself. You know, I believe that if you build it, like they said in Field of Dreams, if you build it, they will come. I believe that when you take the time to make things yourself, you appreciate it more and more importantly other people recognize your appreciation and they in turn appreciate your work you can't buy you know hard work you gotta just put it in yourself the elbow grease i really firmly believe in that that's why i like my job as a special ed teacher because ultimately the kids are really motivated because they know that they're behind and they want to catch up. And so the thing I like the most about that is like the work ethic. Like it doesn't matter like how good you are at something when you start. Nobody cares about where you start. They care about how you finish. If you start in first place and end up dead last, the goddamn hell point of, of going through that race is to come in dead last. It's better to start dead last than finish first. Finish goddamn first place. Damn first motherfucking place, yeah. Son of a gun, that's where you want to end up, first place. It just takes time and patience and diligence and just work it.
and you will get there. You will be rewarded. You gotta work it. Now this is starting to feel saturated because I can feel I can feel it sticking less and sliding more. When the oil feels like it's sliding across the surface, that's when you know the previous layer is saturating it. Also, this wood is super, super porous. I keep saying that, but like my hands are kind of sticky right now and I just touched the dry part of the finish that's like completely untouched by any modifications that I've done and like it immediately tried sucking my fingers in because it really wants to just stick to this finish that I'm putting down which means it's a it's going to be a good solid finish the wood's very porous it's going to accept the finish it's going to come out nice it's going to look good it's going to be worth the effort and time so yeah bit of a pain in the butt but you know worth it so after this we'll do the flying V so it'll take me a couple of days to finish this I'm only going to destroy one guitar at a time <laughs> but yeah this one's out of commission for the next few days I'm going to finish this one up probably sometime next week or the week after um, and then I'm going to start basically at the beginning of July um, the uh, flying V and then I am going on a trip in mid to late July so I will be trying to finish the flying V before I go on that trip and then I go out of town for a minute and come back and you know hopefully by that point I will be able to finish my client project working on the dog grooming company and I will finish um, an album cover for a friend I'm gonna do uh, J-Dog Legacy I'm gonna do his album cover I'm uh, looking forward to that Gonna give him a good album cover which will be uh, a vector based drawing of him with a really nice clean looking script so his record is going to be called Belmont named after the town he grew up in so J Dog Legacy is his name as the artist and then Belmont will be the name of his debut record and uh, I'm gonna put that together for him so I'm gonna reach out to him probably tomorrow and tell him like next week let's meet up and then next week I'm going to talk to him and then tomorrow I'm going to work on my contract with uh, John and Mel well I'm not going to work on it with them I'm going to work on that contract for them and then I will be presenting it to them and then I'll be working on it with them because they'll probably have like some questions or possible revisions um, that's another thing I write my own contracts you know my sister's a lawyer so she checks everything to make sure it's like you know is actually enforceable and makes like some amount of sense but yeah you know like I said do everything yourself making my own album cover making album covers for other people building my own font so that when I publish all of my work it's like my own script you know Lamb of God their font is called Papyrus um, the band down from New Orleans there's their logo down itself uses um, Dark Castle uh, so it's like you you always have these bands where they use fonts, but I, I really respect Mastodon because they always had a custom font made for them, which is really cool. Like the new Mastodon font that Ricky Beckett made or Richie Beckett made um, was just fucking clean um, and just really interesting to look at. Um, so yeah, I really respect like font craft, you know, the ability to make a font. Um, and I'll be using the literal program font craft to probably finish my font because I'm going to make the whole thing in vector based illustrator I've um, been talking about that project for a while I'm going to make it in illustrator and then font craft is going to be the computer program that allows me to export it as a TTF and then you'll be able to download my font and use it and uh, see what it is I've made and uh, so yeah, the font will be used on all of my future posters, on all of my personal album covers, and uh, I will have a proprietary font. And then after that, um, the same font that I use, that I, that I make, when I type my book, I'm going to publish my book in my own font. And I'm gonna do all the artwork myself, design it myself, 
like the layout and stuff that goes into the book. I'm going to do all that myself. So I'm really stoked on that part of it because, um, you know, it's all that, you know, build it yourself. You know, the more you do yourself, the more quality and sort of like integrity there is to the work because, you know, you believe in what you're doing. So, yeah, um, I'm going to do that. It's going to take a long time to get all this shit done. Then, you know, got to finish writing the book. I mean, I finished writing the book. Got to finish editing the book. Um, and then, of course, there's the whole process of, like, publishing it and getting it printed and stuff. That's going to be a whole nonsense in itself. That'll take several years. And then, uh, you know, putting out my own record. I'm going to be building my own computer and putting Pro Tools on it and building a small recording studio in my room. That's kind of, like, the next goal. Um, so I'm just going to keep building things a little bit at a time until I kind of like achieve my goal and that's going to be it. You know, I'm going to just, I'm going to put it together piece by piece and assemble it and that's kind of it. So yeah, the future is mine as long as I reach out to seize it. The future is here for me. I just have to achieve it. So, yeah. Time to clean up. This is the Acid Drip. I'm Keenan Fry, and thank you for watching.